Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Buddhism as Lib Experience monthly lecture series uh, with Dr. Lan Louis Lancaster, jointly organized by the Department of Religious Study and Ariel Graduate Council and sponsored by Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, University of the West. I'm Miro Sake, Chair of Department of Religious Study. And first, I would like to request our president of the University of West, Dr. Minhua Ta, to give an opening remark. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see familiar faces again. And thank you very much for your ongoing support of US, our lecture series, uh, every month. And of course, I would like to thank you, Dr. Lancaster, again, for his generous uh, time uh, and wisdom and the Graduate Council of Religious Study for putting this together and um, Professor uh, Sayat for your continued leadership. Um, it has been a year since the pandemic have put all of us um, on this kind of remote con connection. Um, and it has been creating a lot of challenges uh, to every one of us, including the university. Um, we have to stop all our recruitments uh, efforts uh, be, because uh, we were no longer allowed to go into the high school, to the community colleges. Um, so uh, today I want to take this opportunity and encourage everyone to please uh, join us, um, share your thoughts, your comments in our Instagrams, share your story, sign up on the US Facebook. Um, you will be our best ambassadors. If you like program like this, we hope you can share with your friends, your neighbors, your nieces, your cousins, your families, um, get them to join us and help us spread the words of University of the West. Um, we want to continue doing um, this kind of work and we believe in it. Um, so thank you very much. Um, see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, President Ta. Uh, today, it is a great honor to welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Louis Lancaster. And Dr. Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian Language at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of West, Rosemead. And last month, Dr. Lancaster gave a talk on giving or dana, uh, which is regarded as one of the most important virtue, Buddhist virtue. Today, uh, he is going to talk about another topic uh, important topic, concentration, the strength of keeping focus. So concentration or dhyana occupy a central place in Buddhism. Concentration from the Buddhist perspective means keeping one's attention steady on a single object. So there are enormous benefits of practice, of practicing uh, concentration. The benefit of concentration for the management of stressful situations are now widely acknowledged. And tonight, we are so fortunate to hear about concentration from Dr. Lancaster based on his experience and observation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you very much, uh, Hiroj. <clears throat> It's my pleasure tonight to uh, share with you some thoughts about uh, concentration. Um, my earliest memories of thinking about concentration even <clears throat> came one summer when I was 12 and I was fighting off boredom. Fortunately, I found that we had a complete set of the stories of the detective Sherlock Holmes. When a new mystery came his way, he and his assistant, <clears throat> Dr. Watson, sorry. We 
would set about solving it. Now their approaches were, were often quite different. Dr. Watson would immediately go out and investigate every clue going to the scene and questioning everyone who had seen or heard something. And while Watson was frantically racing about London in this fashion, Sherlock just sat in his leather covered chair with a pipe of tobacco and concentrated. Eventually, Watson would return with all his new evidence and be ready to try to solve the mystery using what he had collected. <clears throat> Sherlock would say, but it's elementary, my dear Watson. And he would proceed to disclose the solution. Watson was chagrined that Sherlock had once again beaten him to the finish and demanded to know how someone sitting in a chair could possibly deal with such complexity. Sherlock would then explain how he logically came to know that the culprit could only be the butler or the tailor or the nephew. As a, as a young reader, I was always thrilled by the power of his concentration. I regretted that I lived in the quiet countryside where no mysteries could be found. And I felt that I had nothing to direct my concentration toward. For me, without a mystery, the practice of concentration could only be something to observe, but not practice. However, I was aware that once the mystery was resolved, Sherlock would fall back into deep depression. And while I didn't quite understand the significance of it, he would inject opium to handle the darkness that always returned. I think that was why I quickly went to the next story, a new mystery. And my hero, Sherlock, would once again concentrate and find contentment in his concentration. He had mastered concentration and using it, he could achieve the solution to the mysteries. But once the solution was found, he could not use his concentration in any other ways. And so I was feeling sorry for him when he solved each case and suffered from the lack of nothing to do. It led me to eagerly go on to the next story where he would find comfort in concentration. He was my hero, but with a flaw. During my first introduction to Buddhism nearly 65 years ago, I took a course, <coughs> excuse me, in comparative religion at USC. I came in contact with concentration again, this time as meditation. The instructor could see that the material was new to me and daunting. And he suggested that I should try to experience meditation rather than just reading about it. At that time on Third Street in downtown Los Angeles, there was an elderly Japanese Zen monk who invited people to his home every Friday night for meditation and a discourse on Buddhist teachings. He was Nyogen Senzaki one of the pioneers and teachers who immigrated to the US. I went to my first Friday night session 
and it was torture. My body resisted the sitting posture on the, that lasted for nearly an hour. The minute I sat on the mat and tried to clear away all thoughts, the opposite happened. My brain seemed to be waiting for these moments to take over and fill my head with constant thoughts about a host of mundane issues that had nothing to do with enlightenment. After that first night, I wasn't sure that this was the way to understand Buddhism. After some weeks of what I considered to be unsuccessful practice, Sandaki Sensei changed the normal flow of the practice. Someone had given him a gift, a guni bird kit. Now the guni bird was weighted so that it would bob back and forth for some time on its own after it had been pushed down to start. Senzaki usually read from a sutra, gave us a few words of explanation after the first period of meditation. Well, that night, instead of reading the sutra, he sat and slowly opened up his gift took out the pieces of the guni bird. <laughs> he never said a word. He just with slow, smooth motions, put the pieces together. His movements were like a dancer and the room was, was completely quiet and every eye was on his hands. When he finished and had set up the guni bird, he placed his teacup in front of it and started its movement. It bobbed up and down as if drinking from the cup. Senzaki finally looked up and beamed and said, that's better than a sutra any day. I realized that for the first time, I had sat quietly and without discomfort and without the usual brain chatter. I had been completely absorbed in watching Senzaki as he concentrated on assembling the guni bird. Well, usually when we finished meditation and I drove home on the LA freeways, I like Sherlock, arrived having lost all the quietude of the session. But the night of the guni bird, it didn't dissipate. And the guni bird had finally given me a glimpse of what concentration can do. As Sandaki said, it had turned out to be better than a sutra. Now the text described the mind as being like a chariot. It's pulled this way and that by six wild and untamed horses, the senses. That's exactly what it felt like when I sat down to meditate. I was experiencing a wild chariot ride with the senses vying for attention and power the pain in my knee from sitting, the itch of my eyebrow, the roar of traffic intruding into the silence, the drone of a neighbor's TV, the restlessness of the person in front of me, my concern about an assignment Worry that my tire looked like it be have, had a slow leak. My bank account with $6. My future. 
like wild horses, they were dragging me and dragging my thoughts and emotions through a wild and uncontrolled ride. I tried to imagine what such a ride would be, look like if reproduced at Disneyland without any way to guide the experience the fear of such a ride could be overwhelming. What had happened to me on the night of the Goonie Bird? How had such a seemingly trivial thing given me fo focus and a bit of control? It was prison work that taught me a great deal about concentration as meditation. When Danny and Shirley Tam, who were with us tonight, had dedicated themselves to providing regular training and teaching about meditation in the prisons, that work resulted in creating an environment for concentration. My short visits allowed me to come in contact with some of the men who had been practicing meditation with them for more than a decade. Their situation allowed these inmates to spend long hours of meditation because in a maximum security prison, inmates are not allowed to do anything that involves an object that could be used as a weapon, no dishwashing, no laundry, no cooking, no gardening. As a result, some of them reported meditating for six or more hours every day. The changes in these men was at time quite profound. After some time of visiting the same groups, they expressed a frustration to me. They found meditation to be powerful and life-changing, but many of them had no background in Buddhism. They knew little about the tradition that had fashioned what they were practicing. Anxious to study, their appeal for a recognized class that would give them credits presented a great challenge. It took nine years to organize a college accredited course with the University of the West giving credit. When the first course was finished, I was anxious to find out what they felt about such study. For the most part, they said that getting more information about Buddhism gave them a deeper understanding of what they were doing when meditating. Even the ones with the longest and most persistent practice acknowledged that their meditation was deepened by what they had learned. They had reached levels of experience that were far deeper than what they had known before. Behavior was different, and many found themselves becoming teachers for their fellow inmates. I began to see the significance of the teachings that identified three poisons that afflict and so cause suffering for all of us. The first poison is when thoughts are scattered and unfocused. The poison that helped ruin my first attempts at meditation, when my uncontrolled thoughts took my whole attention. The antidote for this poison is concentration, mindfulness, if you will. On the night of the Guna Bird, for a few moments, I had concentration. 
and the poison of my delusory thought was stilled. But even when one has stilled the poison of scattered and unfocused thinking, there are still two other poisons left. One is greed, and the other is hateful anger. Now, greed usually makes us think of gluttony, an endless desire for worldly possessions. But for me, uh, greed expresses itself as impatience. I want to have what I want immediately. And my greed for these wants causes fierce bouts of impatience when I don't get my desired state. For me, greed is what I have whenever I get a new computer or a new app. I just want to have mastery over the new item immediately. I want to be able to see it as I've been able to do with my old and familiar ones. But impatience comes with every hurdle and challenge of the new and it is inevitably followed by the third poison, anger. I can be frustrated, impatient thinking, angry thoughts about the engineers who make, up, make my life so complicated. My response is like that of Sherlock. When my concentration is broken by the need to acquire a new skill, Now, concentration alone is powerful. But before I can be at complete ease, all three poisons must be removed. Now, I, I don't suggest that concentration is lacking in value. It is one of the most powerful practices that any of us can perform. Consider the fact that today, mindfulness practice has become a major global movement in the world. The power of mindful concentration was brought to the attentions of government and industry by the work of S.N. Goenka, a wealthy merchant, Indian by birth, but a longtime resident of Myanmar. He tells the story of developing severe migraine headaches and nothing seems to help. So he turned to a Buddhist teacher and asked him to give his training in concentration, meditation, to see if it would cure his pain. His teacher refused to just teach him meditation, vipassana, for the purpose of controlling headaches. Instead, Koinka led him to address all three poisons in his training. Now, later in life, upheavals in Myanmar led him to return to his homeland. By then he was an adept at mindfulness training. His fame went viral when he got permission from the government of India to hold workshops for members of the army and the police force. It is reported that his efforts reached 80,000 of these civil servants. Now the results were very positive. Behavior changed for those who were doing the training. Suicides were not occurring among these men. Mental breakdowns were no longer a major issue. Mindfulness worked for dealing with human problems among these thousands of men. But the training went beyond mere concentration. 
the three poisons were addressed. The texts say that delusion and scattered thoughts can be controlled by concentration. Greed, by learning to focus on the reality of experience rather than projecting wishes and desires for something other than the reality. Anger and hate-filled thoughts required having the insight to understand the nature of the way things are. There are practices that serve as antidotes to the poisons. Now the actress Goldie Hawn has a foundation that promotes mindfulness training among children in elementary schools. During the past, when <laughs> schools were in session, her foundation had convinced large school districts to allow children to be trained. Each day in these schools started with 15 minutes of sitting quietly in mindfulness. Just as with Goenka's efforts in India, the results were significant. One school in San Francisco that <clears throat> ranked at the bottom in terms of performance by its students, after adopting the mindfulness program, found their test scores improved until they were ranked in the upper category of testing and learning outcomes. Well, I, I asked for permission to visit one of these schools where mindfulness was being used in the classroom. And they allowed me to go to a fourth grade classroom and talk to the students. I asked one of the girls, do you like to do morning meditation? She replied, oh yes. I pursued my questioning has it helped you? And in what way? She was excited to share and she replied, when my little brother used to bug me, I hit him and made him cry. Now when he bugs me, I count my breath to 10 and no longer fight with him. She had acquired not only concentration but ways of dealing with all three poisons. One of the inmates who was a longtime meditator told me his story. From his earliest memories, he had always been angry and fighting and it had led to his imprisonment. After he learned to focus his thoughts through meditation, he realized that his anger and his impatience with others was be, being mainly generated by his own thoughts and actions. Over several years of meditating on his cot in the prison, his insights allowed him to drop his angers and his attacks against others. He describes himself as becoming centered and calm and able to be a support to others rather than a punisher. Well, his family lived over a thousand miles away and they only visited him on rare occasions. When they came, found him calm, collected, concerned for others, they were horrified. He was not himself. He was not like what they had come to expect. His mother cried and said that he had been brainwashed 
she could not recognize his behavior. He said he had to tell them that for the first time in his life, he was himself. And the poisons of anger and dissatisfaction had been heavy burdens. His plan for life after prison was to be a true elder of, for his people, to urge them to focus on their lives, to accept responsibility, to see clearly <clears throat> what is happening and to work toward a calm acceptance of their true nature. Now, you can find mindfulness training being offered on hundreds of sites on the internet. And I have seen centers offering training in shopping malls, including this one that's pictured, a shopping mall in Malibu. That their promise, it can make you more successful, more productive, even more creative. And I certainly agree that these promises can be fulfilled. My concern is, like Sherlock, one may find a use for concentration and have the rewards for that use. However, this may be too limited, lacking the full extent of what can be achieved. Concentration can, within the Buddhist system, deal with all the poisons that cause us suffering, cause us to act in destructive ways, cause us to hit out at others cause us to have road rage on the freeway, cause us to be impatient, cause us to have hostile responses. Yes, concentration is a great practice that we can acquire with personal effort. It can be so much more when it is practiced together with insights. Openness to the reality of any situation. When the self-centeredness is replaced with generosity and understanding of others. From my perspective, the time spent in mindful concentration is richly rewarding. However, I will be forever grateful to Senzaki Sensei for showing the Guni bird. It let me have a glimpse of concentrating and experiencing ease in an ordinary day-to-day -day mundane event. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, for a wonderful and insightful talk and your effort along with Neville D and other friends in prison projects are especially praiseworthy. Thank you for your contribution to society. And here begins our question association. Uh, I haven't seen any question. Uh, please write your question on in the chat box. There is one question uh, from Professor Susan Ko. Dr. Lancaster, how do you take meditation or mindfulness if you would prefer as the research subject in religious study? How we deal, deal it as a researchable subject? Any proper method? 
suggest? Yes, I, I think it's always a question which we have. In the academic world, I sometimes describe what has to happen to us is um, I would never give a talk like this before. I always flew under the radar in terms of my own ideas and thinking. I wanted to have a job and I wanted to have tenure and I wanted to have support from my academic colleagues. But one day in Sydney, Australia, not too long ago, I would never be able to do it today, but I took a very long walk with a friend. And during that walk, she allowed me to open up about some of my own thoughts, my own experiences. And, and it, I felt good about it. It helped me. And that was the origin of these monthly talks to be truthful. That I am now ready to do this kind of thing a bit, to share my own thinking, um, to be emotional, <laughs> to uh, be personal. Maybe it's my age. I don't tell every young person to do it in the academic world. It's not always safe. Uh, I'm at a place where, of course, what are they going to do to me? President Todd can fire me. Uh, Somehow I'll survive. <laughs> but I do think <clears throat> that what Goldie Hahn, from another perspective, what Goldie Hahn tells school boards, she goes in and she shows them all the data that's being collected on the power of mindfulness. And when they say, but this is religion, we don't want this in our schools. She said, look at this, this is science. Here's your proof, it works. How can you refute it? And, the, and they accept it, they agree with her. And even in very conservative school districts, they have allowed this to occur because it works. So you can research it. Thank you, Lou. Uh, next question from Martin. Can you please talk about the transcendent aspect of meditation as compared to internal investigation for the mitigation and mitigation of the three poisons? Yeah, this, that's a very good question, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you the, the right answer tonight, but I think that if we cannot be transcendent within ourselves, it won't do us much good to be transcendent. That is, we usually think of transcendence as something up there, the whole world, the whole cosmos. 
beyond thinking, outside of ourselves, surrounded and, and swamped with these wonderful feelings. But I think that that transcendence, as you've said, uh, that transcendence is, is something which is being generated to some degree, at least our experience of it in this very body. I remind people, the Buddhists say the only way you can get to nirvana is in a human body. Our body is, is not such a drag on any of this as we might imagine. We need to take seriously our experience, our body. We need to look to see <clears throat> in what way whatever we do has an impact on us. Um, this is just to give you an example of how important I think it is to, to, to try to deal with things personally. One of the things that the famous actress Audrey Hepburn had was that she was known to be so loving and caring for children everywhere in the world. She worked for UNICEF. She was a remarkable woman, not just a movie star, but she gave her life and people said all her life, she loved others. But then one of her neighbors said, in the end, she came to love herself. And I thought, that's, that's what we need to do in our lives. It's very hard to bring it all back to ourself. And the, and the love of self that I'm talking about, I think you see, it's not an egotistical, look at me, I'm great. It says, nobody knows me like I know myself. Nobody ever is going to have the power to really love me totally unless I can do it myself. I haven't reached that stage, but if, if Audrey Hepburn reached it, I'm so happy for her. So transcendence, can I have it in myself? Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, there's no more question, but I have one question. So in, in prison world, prison, there's so many, uh, like a meditation center all over the United States, it's become more commercialized. It's commercialized. So do you have any tips for like ordinary, like people like us, how to find the good meditation center, Dharma center, how to pick the right Kalyanamitra or spiritual frame or meditator instructor, meditation interest instructor. As I, as I think I understand your question, I have a little trouble hearing it. <clears throat> when you commercialize something, <laughs> we all know that really changes it. And 
if I'm doing something in order to get a financial reward, that's what I'll get. It doesn't necessarily say I'll get anything else but that. It's like concentration. If I concentrate only to solve a mystery, that's what I'll get. Nothing else, like Sherlock. He didn't get anything else. It's not that the mindfulness groups that are making money from it are doing something which is evil or wrong. I'm sure that many of them do a lot that's very good. And they have reached people which the Buddhists may, would never reach probably. So I, I don't want to say, pay no attention to those storefront mindfulness centers. Far from it. Let them thrive. However, as I've said, my only concern is that if you go to one of those and you use your concentration for a specific purpose, that's all you'll get. It may be good for you, but that's all you'll get. I think from the Buddhist perspective, we are trying to say that concentration is just part of the whole area of dealing with the three poisons. And that you have to work to get rid of all three poisons to be truly at ease. So if you want to meditate so you'll be a better stockbroker, fine, that's what you'll get. And it may, and it does help people. They do become better stockbrokers. But if that's all they get, I, I'm, I'm sorry because there's so much more that can be achieved beyond just that. How can we figure out how to say to people, practice mindfulness for your job, if that's what you need, please go do it, yes. But please understand, there are some other poisons in there that are going to hold you back. Address them all if you can. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, Dr. Langston, how to meditate in the social environment? Uh, from Danny Tan. Yeah. Well, I, I think everybody has to seek for a way to do it. Um, meditation from one perspective is a very personal thing. Although when I first went to the meeting with Senzaki Sensei's group, um, I found out something which really amazed me. Even though he was, he and himself was a great teacher, wonderful, wonderful person. There was one woman in the group and if she was there, the meditation was better. I never figured out what she did to make it better. If she wasn't there, I was always, I knew that something was missing. So meditation is, is very personal, 
But if you can find a good friend who gives you that extra <laughs> support in a group, it can be wonderful. For many people, I really recommend to do it as a group exercise. They'll be much more successful, I think, at least in the beginning. And if you can find a group where there's somebody that gives you that extra energy and, and chemistry, count yourself lucky. Thank you. Another question from Randy. It seems to me that all religious practice have a component of contemplative action. Do you think that Buddhist practice has a special insight into contemplative meditation? Is there a unique aspect to Buddhist mindfulness? Oh, uh, of course. Uh, all religions do have some form of contemplative practice. Of course, they do. And some are very powerful and very meaningful. The, the Buddha, Buddhist text themselves said, there's nothing magical about samadhi. Anybody can do it. Anybody can sit and concentrate and count their breath, say the Buddhist. Of course, you, anybody can do it. We don't claim any magical formula here. Um, however, I do believe that each religion has its own uniqueness. And it's very important to see what that uniqueness is. Buddhist meditation is not like prayer. You're not asking for anything in one sense. There's no, no request. There's no negotiation. If you'll give me this, if you'll let me be successful, then I promise to meditate. You don't have negotiation. You don't have requesting you. That's not, that's part of many religious traditions and it's part of Buddhist tradition as well in certain places, certain areas. But the Buddhist practice that we've been talking about where you're trying to solve the three poisons and to get rid of the three poisons uh, I believe is part of its uniqueness. That it has a specific agenda, which is to remove from us the inability to focus our thoughts, the inability to see life as it really is, the inability to to go beyond ourselves. So I think that, that the Buddhists have plenty that's unique to them and plenty which they share with all other religions. Thank you. Another question from Robert Wang. Would you say that love of life, love of self is a form of selflessness? Usually I would say yes. <laughs> I would say yes. But when I, I heard that statement about Audrey Hepburn, I felt that her neighbor was saying the opposite of selfishness, that she gave constantly to the children of the world, that she sacrificed for the love that she felt for others, and that her experience of the actress was that one day she came to have the same love for herself. The love that you feel toward a child, 
that's not selfish or shouldn't be. I, but would it be like if you could love yourself as much as you love a baby, not asking something of it, not thinking what a great person I am, not thinking that people are going to praise me, not thinking any of that. It's a new thought for me. I'm still working with it. Please, you guys think about it too and, and share with me your thoughts. What, is, what would it be like to love myself as I am? Thank you. Uh, next question from Ronald. Uh, do you have any tips on how to generalize the fruit of our concentration or meditation practice on the meditation mat to our everyday activities? Well, from, from <clears throat> as with most learning, I, I think you start off slow. You start off on the mat. Learn how to sit on that mat for a while. Learn how to have the ease of sitting on the mat. And then you begin to figure out when I'm out in the world, like the little girl with her brother, she said, when he bugs me, I just do a little bit of my meditative practice and I don't hit him. So my impatience is one of the poisons. When I'm impatient, what can I do out in the world when I'm faced with something like a computer that won't do right? What can I do? What can I do when I say, the best thing for me to do is to recognize the reality of what I'm working with here not asking it to be something, but just recognizing what is really the case. If I can do that, then I will be less impatient. I will be less angry when I have to work to acquire the skill because I will have recognized that's just the way this machine works. Nobody made this machine to work this way to torment me. I'm tormenting myself because I won't accept the reality of the way it's put together. And that, that I think we can carry into our life at any time. The last question, thank you. Uh, last question, uh, in regard in regard to that is all you get. I do see that as a potential problem. I often wonder how people can just sit and cultivate peace for their individual self when so many aspects of the world does not have that privilege. What can be done so all can have that privilege to meditate from you, Well, you know, one of one of the one of the things about meditation is and the Buddhist meditation a fourth grader can do it a fourth grader can learn to count her breath a fourth grader can learn to concentrate it's not that what I'm when I, I talk about this, it's not that we own or anybody owns meditation. Nobody owns or has ownership or control of mindfulness. It's everywhere. It's already there. 
And you can go anywhere in the world and I'll guarantee you that you will always find somebody in that remote place who has mastered some form of, of mindfulness. I, I think back to um, people that I've met through the years you know, in many different countries. And very often there is somebody in that place that I see has that certain something, calm acceptance. They have achieved something of understanding. It's already available. It's not something we have to export. We don't, we don't have a, it stored somehow in a silo in any country with the ships waiting to transport it to someplace else. These, these things, human nature is everywhere. Now we can, we can help. But when we help and when we teach, we must teach as partners. not as experts. That's what we are, we're partners. That's why I've said to you before, I feel I don't really teach anything. People learn. People partner with me when I give a talk. I'm learning, you're learning, we're partners. We're partners in this seeing all the other people here who are, who are thinking about the same thing, doesn't that give you some feeling of comfort? You're not alone. These are your brothers and sisters. These are the good sons and daughters they speak of in Buddhism. We're all doing it. And I thank you for being here tonight I thank you for your wonderful questions. I wish I could give better answers. I'll try better as I go into this partnership with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, uh, for an insightful thank talk. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Thank and you, Dr. Shaker. An insightful talk and uh, answering all the questions. So we look forward to have you again on Tuesday, April 20th at 7 p.m. And the topic of the next lecture is wisdom, the self-knowledge transform. I hope you all can join. So we have only three left. And at last, I would like to thank President Ta, Dr. Eva Mura, Prince Eva Mura, and Dr. Sozan Ko, Christopher Johnson, Venable D. Hong, Venable Srinanda, and Fong Sam for their help and encouragement. And thank you everyone for attending and stay safe and have a good night.